First of all, I'd like to thank Mika for essentially giving my presentation, but in an intelligent way, so I can now effectively dumb everything down. Um, but even if that was Mika, because he really didn't look like the guy that was on his profile picture there. Uh, there was a hairy guy out there, but anyway. Right, VR, AR, the Internet of Things, they're all things that everyone wants to talk about, but more than anything else, VR is probably the one. Um, so I will probably talk more about that than anything else here. Um, which is one thing that I get asked to talk about more than anything else. Now, we, Rabbit as a company, we produce all sorts of amazing, innovative things, digital content, creative content for almost any platform. The thing behind me here highlights some of the firsts that we've done from the world's first uh, full car orchestra of cars for Lexus, where we had each car itself is using its own stereo to create an orchestra and you know incredible live piece of music um, to demonstrate actual products so we were we were using the um, you know the devices the models the cars themselves to create an event um, now next up Guinness World Records, um, Johnny mentioned earlier Guinness World Records, which uh, we have a very close affinity to because we launched the iPad app on the day the iPad launched. Um, and, you know, great content to put out. And, you know, a big part of what we do is to identify what content will work best on what platform for, for whichever audience that is. Uh, and the iPad was something that lent itself perfectly for that. Uh, and then we look at something like the Apple Watch uh, for Portacar Connect. We were able to give owners the opportunity to unlock their cards and move out the wing mirrors and do all the, you know, they're still small steps, but this is about the internet thing becoming something relevant. And we were there on day one again to give that audience, you know, and they're an audience that very much are about first, because if you're an then then more than likely you want to one up and chip with the guy that drives the BMW that lives next door. Uh, and then stereo cards in the corner is our um, now I will come obviously more onto VR, but it's uh, it's our program format for VR because there is lots and lots of content, and it's lots of random content scattered all over the place from YouTube to app platforms that you have to download in order to then download some more content and view that within that. So for an audience that essentially you know, internally us working in VR, we assume quite wrongly that everyone already has actually experienced VR and those that have are a tiny tiny percentage um, so what we wanted to do was to use a programming format, not recognisable kind of 20 minutes of bringing an audience into one place, now that doesn't mean you then stand like you do in, a, in an audience within a TV studio, you stand as close to the people being interviewed or those playing live music and then from those moments we take people out to be sat in the passenger seat of a supercar or skydiving. All of the things that you know, VR plays on so well. But it's not about just a big demo of VR, it's about content that people will be genuinely interested in. So it becomes a format that we don't just attract more people that are just creating VR. It's about an audience that's currently sat outside VR that we need to get eyeballs on. And then what do I do? Well I as head of innovation brand, we've worked with all of these brands, and you know they're a really diverse mix. Lots of automotive in there, lots of entertainment, um, lots of leisure. Now all of those lend themselves to entertaining an audience, and VR is particularly relevant to that. Um, so my role is to highlight new technology, new platforms, and VR has been the new next or the next big thing for the last three years. So I've, I've almost I'm, I'm unfortunately got stuck talking about the next big thing because it continues to shift on and move to being the next big thing. Now, 2017 will of course be the year of VR, as was 2016 and 15. Um, now, kind of the first of those three years was there for developers to get their heads under the hood and think about what works, what can we do with it. Uh, not just developers, but filmmakers, and how do we you know, how do we approach a medium? No completely different way um, because your audience can look wherever they want to so how do you then tell stories um, with an audience that can actually tell their own and, and then so I then get to wave my arms around and play with all sorts of new technology within VR that many many people don't get their hands or eyeballs on for 
you know, so this is the, this is the point now where people are finally getting their hands on them. Um, but it means also that a lot of our clients and a lot of things we do sit well and truly under the radar. So beyond that, which I'll also elaborate a little bit on some AR, so I, I, I get to play with the other things that either make me look fairly ridiculous, um, lots of those headsets do. VR is one of those things where we're actually quite forgiving of how stupid we look, unless we sat in the kind of the, the shoeshine chair that's outside the room and, and everybody laughs at you with the headset on. If you're at home, that, that, that's not a concern. Uh, if you're, even if you're in the office, to be fair, um, you're not out in public walking down the street as we faced with Google Glass, as we will potentially face with augmented and, I do hate the term, mixed reality because it's, kind of, it's essentially augmented reality but with a different name. I won't get into that today. I could speak from the entirety of my presentation just on that. I won't. Um, but we do face that social problem where we are putting on essentially a headset, walking out in public so that we can experience the amazing world out there that offers us this mixed augmented reality and overlay of content and mixing of amazing entertaining content whilst looking pretty stupid. Um, now, I have got my drone with me and I was going to threaten to bring it on stage with me today, but that leads into my time with all the other interesting things I have to talk about. Um, but essentially, that's a good example of an artificially intelligent drone where it will use facial recognition and it will follow you around. Now, artificial intelligence is a huge subject in itself and it's, you know, it's, it's vast in its implication and its application. But um, this is a good example of essentially the future of the selfie stick, um, when you no longer need the stick and your cam, your personal camera and your, your robotic flying thing essentially follows you around. Now, I mean, that's quite throwaway in what it does right now, but actually that's quite an interesting vision of the future. You think about that personal assistant that will sit on your phone or your watch or in your ear for hearables. Um, why not have that following you around and, and filming every conceivable minute of your day? Um, right through to, I get to play with all sorts of cars and bikes and, and, and real fun stuff. Um, it's all work. Um, but this is for augmented reality helmets, where that, that becomes a really, really useful item because you're seeing all of that information in front of you, exactly where you should see it. Now, with the cars, we've had heads-up displays for years, um, but they do not follow exactly where you're looking, so it's not delivering that information in, in, in your field of vision. Uh, and then finally, I've, I'm actually sat on some the future of mobility. It's not really. To be fair, I was struggling not to fall off or not to run into the barriers. Honda's little device there that uh, if you're not keen on walking, if you're, you don't have a desk and you want to sit with your laptop and your knees, probably would solve that. But the future of transport is, is another big subject. So, VR. I spent, foolishly, spent 24 hours in virtual reality earlier this year for T3 magazine. Um, now, that experience was good and bad. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. Uh, the main reason I did it was because in VR, no matter how, what you do, no matter how good the experience, no matter how good the headset and all the equipment that you're using, you are always consciously aware of going into virtual reality. So you see what you see around you, put a headset on, that's, that's all part of the process. Now, what I wanted to do was to actually fall asleep in virtual reality, so that when you woke up, you just believed what you saw. So you didn't go through any of that, that theatre of putting something on. Um, so it's a bit like waking up in an unfamiliar hotel room. You don't question the existence of the hotel room, but you, you may be confused as to where it is. Uh, it's probably a reflection on the amount that I've traveled. But um, in VR, you wake up and you're, uh, you're in the middle of uh, Lord of the Rings kind of set up or you're flying the Millennium Falcon. You just believe you're there. Um, again, that might be more of a reflection on me. Uh, but that, that's, that was the interesting kind of scientific takeaway from all of it. The, the rest of it was considerably less scientific and not trying not to be arrested or fall in front of a train. Um, but it, it was more frustrating that the following day, um, someone broke the Guinness World Records, well, back to Guinness World Records again, broke the Guinness World Records for 25 hours in virtual reality. So the lesson may be for all of us, never go to the easy numbers. Don't go for one day, go for a day and an hour. Um, 
But Brownwich, we've our first piece of VR was, was produced 18 years ago. So there's obviously there's lots of new businesses, there's lots of startup opportunities within VR um, to come to the you know come to the table essentially with amazing new kit from Ozo cameras to headsets that deliver great content in an easily packaged way. Now, 18 years ago, the scene was very, very different. So, you know, we had the same ideas and we had the same experiences, but we did not have the audience. Because what we have now, you know, we have a, a, a Samsung S7 that will plug into a Gear VR, and that's something from your pocket plugged into a piece of plastic. You know, that's very, very easily accessible. Google will offer you a piece of cardboard. Um, and that allows you to then share that in a, in a you know a way that lets you sit in as a takeaway or to the post. Um, so we have a much 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 larger audience now. The hunger is obviously great on some because people can relate to this now. But again, we need to talk about how we build that hunger because if that audience still doesn't really know about it because they haven't tried it. Um, VR for me is the most, it's the easiest thing in the world to talk about. So I tell you, you might have to drag me off stage, I know I've got a can for that. Um, but I can talk about it for hours because it is so exciting, it has so much potential in so many areas. But it's also the most difficult thing to actually deliver to an audience because I'm not going to at any point here say, right, now all of you just put your headsets on. Um, or I'm going to show something on screen and you will then have a virtual reality experience. That's not going to happen. Um, even after this, I can't just send you a link and presume that you will all be able to see it. Because people do not have headsets um, in any scale. So it, that, that itself makes it very difficult to sell in the concept, let alone the content. But we have to persevere with that. And again, Samsung of the world and, and, and everybody else, the manufacturers, the, the priority and the onus is on them to really get that in front of audiences, uh, as developers, as creators, as directors. We can't be expected to go out there and do the legwork, but the people making the platforms have to do that. So 18 years of making great content across, you know, some of this is 3D, some of this is content that inevitably ends up in a virtual environment from Star Wars to Doctor Who to putting people on planet surfaces, so much potential. Uh, and then even within the company, we will then broadcast content. So I've briefed the London, Windsor and San Francisco offices live via VR um, so that I could sit in a car, not breaking the speed at any point at all. Um, I could sit in a car and brief an automotive project in, in virtual reality. Um, now, no real reason because it wasn't a VR project, but the, the, the main thing there was thinking about how the audience, which was the rest of the company, took that that brief on board um, and it was that one-to-one -one and feeling as if they were being spoken to that made such a big difference to me being this, even this level of detachment. So, the market. I'm not going to go into any depth on these because I realise I'm there's not enough time, there's too much stuff, not enough time. So many headsets out there now, from kind of the lowest common denominator from Peter Google Cardboard right up to the Rapture and the Void. Now, I will cover the Void briefly in a second because it is by far the most exciting VR experience available um, to date. Uh, just because of the, the, the sheer level of immersion and to, to be able to take you into the environment and offer physical feedback. Uh, and then pretty much everything in between are those higher end headsets that will cost you a decent chunk of money if you have to buy a PC as well, or something that's much more powerful if it's a PlayStation VR headset that you just plug into a console. But I'm not here to talk about the tech, I'm here to talk about the content. Um, so centered reality, this is what I'm talking about, that VR needs to exist within a, a, an ecosystem. If we're just talking about, I had this amazing two minute video experience in VR here, and I played a game for 20 minutes here. Um, now we need to think about how people get to see that content, and then what do they take away from it? Do they take away the feeling of wanting to immediately come back in again, or to use and, and, and abuse that kind of content? Um, or do they spread the word, do they tell more and more people about it? And with that, you take that out and remove the word VR or AR or anything else that's in there and you replace it with just a marketing strategy and that makes complete sense. Why would you not do that? Um, we spent years and years making apps and you, the amount of clients that would say, this is my app budget and that budget is enough to make an app. And then afterwards they say, right, well, 
we'll wait for the sales to roll in and everybody to download that. But they forget that they need to tell people it exists and to keep the thing supported and alive and a, a living, breathing digital product. Um, so examples behind. Oh, there we go. Um, so all of these examples here, I'll go through pretty quickly. We've got um, the Martian, uh, which Ridley Scott movie. Um, working with frame store, um, sorry, the, the third floor, they did a great job of, of essentially taking an audience into VR, but using the VR headset and, and the, almost the claustrophobia of being in a VR headset and that, that confinement as a plus point for the experience. Because you think about being in a space helmet or being inside a small capsule. Um, that's actually something that it's very hard to replicate unless you're doing exactly what you know that feeling you get across in a, in a headset. So they did a great job there. Um, and then over to um, Sulong Q, uh, again another great headset that combines rather than a, a lot of the mixed reality experiences are about using um, essentially an augmented reality headset and then placing things in an environment. I and mean, you can't go full VR with that. Whereas this headset, you can you go you start in full VR, but you can have twin stereoscopic cameras that deliver all of that environment around you, um, and then you're able to place content within it. So again, I'll be very brief with this. Um, so let's kick off with the Martian. Mars has never been closer to being within our grasp. With VR, you're inside it. You are the person walking on the planet. It's uncanny. I'm so thrilled that we can invite people into the Martian VR experience. Okay, let's do this. So a great experience where I say it's playing on actually the restrictions of what we'll be faced with pieces of plastic on our faces eventually. Um, and then Sulon Q, so this is a, I can talk over this one, great example of, so what you're seeing there is, is as if you were in the room, the cameras are beaming through the content. Um, everything around you is as you saw it before you put the headset on. Now what it does is it does full room scanning, so you know where the walls and the ceiling and everything is, um, and the beams, the magic beams, are breaking out of your floor, and they're bursting through your ceiling, and it's quite challenging here, I must admit. Um, and then, because there's no wires, there's nothing trailing behind you, you're then able to walk around and look up through the hole in the ceiling that this beanstalk has just made. Um, so as you do that, you're looking up. So again, this is still your room surrounding you, but with this new virtual content in that environment. Um, but the thing, the difference with the Silicon Q over a kind of an augmented experience is that you would have cut-off points, and you can't then suddenly deliver something that spreads over the full field of vision and delivers a, 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 an entirely made-up environment. But what we then see here is that because um, this is Jack and the Beanstalk, we then see the giant beginning to look in over, over your. Again, you can walk underneath and you see him, so you look at your ceiling. Uh, and because we can take this and we can capture that environment that you're looking around and that live office essentially here, um, he can then fumble around, you're walking around, he's, he's caught you now, grabs you and then pulls you up through your ceiling into full virtual reality. So that is an amazing experience. And you know, this, this delivers on, if we had a blank sheet of paper and it was a wish list of saying what if, um, the, the type of platforms and technology that we're now facing are you know, allowing us to have that creative freedom to not work within confines. You know, if, we, if we're working to a phone in a piece of cardboard, that's one thing. If we're working to the top end and these kind of experiences, that's, that is amazing. Right, I'm going to move on. Um, and then this, I, I, I will play this one through. This is an amazing thing by Lockheed Martin. Martin um, the video talk for himself. Someone in my 
my generation, someone in school today, could be the first people on Mars. I actually would like to go to Mars. Like, I'm not just saying that. Like, I would. Now, I personally debate whether this is a virtual reality experience. Now, it, it's a virtual experience in, in itself. If we were talking about this five years ago, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have used the word virtual reality. It, this would have been an experience. Um, but it's, it's fantastic nonetheless. And what it does is highlight, particularly for education, the, the thing that... The takeaway from that for me is that the kids were so inspired by what they saw um, that they wanted to do it and repeat that themselves. So a lot of VR experiences that are spreading out into schools at the moment are about showing the top of Mount Everest or the bottom of the deepest ocean or essentially lots of experiences that are then being described as un unattainable. It's amazing what we can show you but the, the, the emphasis is not on them actually achieving that. So I think VR has an, in, you know, an incredible role to play in inspiring. And, and again, where we're talking about, and talking about today is VR not being a standalone experience. It's about complementing existing experiences and existing ways of teaching and learning and training and you know living you know, through gaming and, and, and film uh, as much as anything else. But for education in particular, you think about you know learning about what it is you're about to see, experiencing it, and remembering what you've just done. And then what does it deliver? What does it inspire you to do? But, you know, sometimes it will inspire you to go and look at it again. But more importantly, for those kids then, it inspires them to say, you know, I can do that. I, I want to fly to Mars. Yeah, that's a that's a great thing to do. So anyway, I'm very conscious of it. Um, and then finally, the void. So I spoke about it a little bit briefly. The essentially this environment you put on your headset, as we do with all the VR experiences. You also put on your haptic vest. You clutch your haptic laser gun, uh, and you step into a VR environment. Now, with an HTC Vive, you can step into a VR environment, but you can't feel it. Um, now, you can, you know, mentally, it can seem as if you feel it, but there's nothing there, there's no feedback. Now, with the void, they set it up so they have physical walls in an environment. So, you know this when you go in. So, the first thing you do is you walk up and you touch all the walls. Um, but very quickly, that wears off because you, you don't do that in reality. You don't touch everything. Um, that's not what we do. So the thing where it actually becomes really, really exciting is when you just walk past the wall and you brush it with your elbow and you, you I'm here. That really, really grounds you. Um, and then, so in a gaming environment such as this, you'll feel the hits when someone shot you or, or thrown something at you. Uh, you'll walk past a flaming torch and you'll feel the heat. Um, the walls will break down on the edge of the kind of temple environment here and you'll feel the wind washing over you. So you, you know, every step of the way it's adding another level of immersion. So you get to the point where you're not just thinking this is an amazing experience, you just think I am here. Uh, and I am here is you know, from amazing, amazing space stations to temples to um, where I was a couple of weeks ago in New York, the Madame Tussauds Ghostbusters experience. So this is where you suddenly think about how does that become an extension for film and entertainment. You know, if you can be in the film, that's incredible. Um, now you don't want to be in every film, and I, I do stress the point that I've never needed to be in Police of Hollywood 3. Um, I've never felt the need to be in many, many films, um, and some are actually quite possibly recoil from. But these kind of things really do extend a franchise and a, and a brand within a film, and you know it's it's utterly believable. Now I felt really bad about shooting Mr. Slater. Um, <laughs> could you think you're basically shooting a cartoon character in the face with a laser weapon and you, and, you know joking aside the psychological effect of that is you, you, you think it's so real that you don't want to do it but, but you can um, so anyway great experience to say the void by far and, and above I, I would easily say that's the, the best um, VR experience you can have um, now hard to reality I'm going to be very brief with this one 30 seconds. You're going to have to drag me off, you realise. 
Um, Mark reacted. This was a video created this year. But amazing example of of play. Um, great, amazing example of the potential future for augmented reality. Now, I mean, we all laughed about it at the time because we thought this is oh my god! Imagine being in this environment where there is so much surrounding you. Your field of vision is full. Um, so here is someone sat on a bus and they're just playing games and then they're receiving incoming messages and they're taking a call and then finally they kind of swipe that out of the way you can just about see your environment. Um, so, you know, that seems ridiculous. But actually what it does is it, it very effectively illustrates the potential for, for augmented content. Um, so you imagine, no, no one wants to pay for anything. Uh, although PlayStation is onto a onto a winner in as much as it's a freak in amongst all of digital content where people will still spend fifty dollars on a game but no one will pay anything for something on their phone. And they're the same people the big some of the games console and the phone. But anyway. So for augmented reality you think about the you know, essentially for everyone is given everything. And you pay to strip that content back again. Um, so if you think you were immediate, this is the future for you, so you're given all of this. The first thing you want to do is remove all, as much as possible of that. So you begin to subscribe to, now that subscription may be financial, but that subscription also could be, the cost could be your data. So you could pay in personal information that, you know, to be fair, most of us are giving up anyway, but it means that the brands will strip back that content and make your life more bearable by you just trading either, either the cash or info. Um, so all of these environments, perfectly plausible, perfectly achievable, but I think it's a great illustration of saying, you know, this is potentially how we work within an environment where people don't want to pay for anything. Um, so anyway, the headlines. Oh, I'm fine, there's just some awards coming up, isn't it? Um, so everyone wants to give the big headlines about VR and AR, and essentially it will be worth a hundred gazillion dollars. Um, because uh, we don't know, uh, but also my point I'm trying to make here is that it potentially, no matter what figure I've got up here, it could still be worth almost zero. Now, the reason for that would be if we do a really, really poor job of getting the content out there. So I've already kind of said about getting headsets on people's faces. Um, but also if we make too much crap, if we make bad experiences, it's not like going to YouTube and next, 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 or anything else that we currently browse. It's because they're all detached from us, they're all on another device or a platform away from us. If you go into VR, you have made a personal commitment to saying, right, I've loaded it on this, I've attached it to this, I've put it on this. Um, now, I've made all that effort just to get to the point before I press play or start. Uh, now, if the first thing that happens there is poor, people won't come back again. Now, uh, I struggle when I talk at conferences where it's an audience full of developers or an audience full of filmmakers, and they will all then shout to me, but it's too good to go away. We know that. And in knowing that, we should make great stuff. We have to make really good stuff. Otherwise, you know, people, if you took their mobile phone away, it would be the end of their lives. I'm here in this country and I can't get a signal, so I'm twitching sad at the top because I can't cope. Um, now, if you took my VR headset away, clearly I haven't got it now, I'm not feeling the same thing. So we haven't reached that. Until we reach that, then it is, it's still expendable. Um, steps to virtual We'll rush through these. Actually, I'll probably share the, the, the presentation here. You can all just take more notes on that. But um, filmmaking, marketing, education, retail, all big subjects, all lots of words. Now, uh, essentially, I'm, you know, VR and 360 video isn't new. Um, I already made that point, but that's 18 years ago. 360 video particularly isn't new. It's just that we now have an audience that's come back to it. Um, monoscopic versus 360. Stereoscopic. Now, uh, that again, I think if stereoscopic 3D content is immersive, 360 video just dropped in a headset is not VR, it's 360 content dropped in a headset. Um, something I hate it for that because you're looking around with a little camera. But it's a little camera that creates stuff that goes on a headset that isn't VR. Um, now, add the value, can't talk about that, so I will move on. Um, marketing is still essential. It's, a, it's an amazing platform right now because a lot of it is still people wanting to talk about the fact that they're just doing it. Um, but they also need to make sure they're doing the right stuff. When the audience gets hold of it, say it's got to be the right experience. So select the right stuff. 
make it work, obviously. Um, now, location is, is about where you host it. Um, so not just putting it somewhere to, to put it on YouTube or to make it some kind of app-based content. Um, but then tell people it exists. Don't just expect them to find it. Um, and then activate it. So, you know, that gift of VR, a piece of cardboard folded flat, drops to the post, and your audience suddenly has the ability to view this. And then education, so again, the point there was about making sure kids have some takeaway from this, so that they are energised, that they want not just to come back to VR, but come back to the subject and the content that you, you offer them. Um, and then retail experiences, you know, that's new to all of us, because retail is not yet mastered in any way, shape or form in VR. Um, we were asked a question recently, well, luckily they asked us the question because we work with World Play, we work with Visa, we work with banking online in a digital environment. You know, how do we work? What's the future of, of, of payments in VR? Um, now, we were able to give an answer, but they were also asking the guys with some GoPros on a stick. Now, they are not the people to trust with your money. Um, if you're going to employ them to create a 360 video, fine. If you're going to use them to deliver the future of encoded payment online in a virtual environment, they're not the people to talk to. Um, again, and it's about that takeaway. People are not going to hand over their details in a virtual environment. It has to be before and then the way that you deliver it afterwards. Uh, and then the takeaway steps, you know, this is about VR and AR sitting in the middle um, of, a, of that infrastructure and the way we deliver it. Um, make stuff that people actually will understand how to use and view it, um, so they're not throwing up all the time as well, which is pretty useful. Um, and then passive versus interactive, do you actually give someone an interactive way of, of, of working with that content, or do they sit back and let it flood around them? And then VR is not the future of film, it's not the future of gaming, and it's not the future of education. It is a future. So we will not have every film in VR, we will not have every game in VR, we will not have all of the, the way we educate kids. It's not suddenly the way to educate them, it's just a, a piece of that, you know, that, that journey for kids and, and adults in the way that we, we offer training. Um, and the way to deliver that all is to collaborate. So the example with, with a retail and payment environment, do not give it to the guy with the GoPros on the stick, let him do some 360 video, but work with the people that can effectively and securely deliver that. And then, almost finally, uh, my poor kids get all of this stuff inflicted on them. All of this stuff. Um, now, Hattie, on the right, was three when she got her first bit of VR um, four years ago. I'm, I'm such a horrible, irresponsible parent that I'm inflicting things that are not medically tested or anything else on them, but they love it. They love it. Um, but the point here is that they are the future audience for this. So what do they want from it? Not what do we want from it. What can we do to enable their content? to be relevant in the years to come. That's so, so important. We forget about how relevant our kids are and what honest answers they will give to everything. Something that we think is amazing. They will turn around and say, that's all right, or you have nothing to do with me. What, what else have you got? And they won't care about that boardroom polite environment where the rest of us just get, think we're getting positive feedback. And then finally, the, the, the biggest thing about VR is the way that we learn. Um, so we, we retain 10% of what we read, we retain 20% of what we hear, 30% of what we see, 50% of what we see and hear combined, 70% of what we discuss with other humans in a, in a you know, live environment, but 80% of what we think that we have personally experienced. So, and that's the thing about VR and immersion is you think you have experienced it. Not you have experienced watching it on something else. You have been there. So for learning across education and training, it is essential. And that's me. Thanks. Sorry for the overrun. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dean.